Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. And uh, Yiling and I are co-chairs of WINE this year, so you should all <laughs> submit your very best work to WINE. It's going to be a great conference uh, right here in Harvard. Um, so this is, uh, I'm going to talk today, I mean, one of my interests within algorithmic game theory is the area of uh, social networks. And in social networks, I'm very interested in understanding what conditions give rise to a heterogeneity of uh, either behaviors or types or actions of agents in the social network. So for example, in, if we're playing, say, a prisoner's dilemma game in a social network, when can we, and under what conditions can we support a uh, heterogeneity of cooperation and defection within the social network? Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, something similar, but with a heterogeneity of types. So I'm going to look at networks. I'm going to ask, when do the networks support an integration of types, say ethnicities in a city, for example? And this uh, work is joint work with uh, Christy Brandt and G. Kamath, who is there, and uh, Bobby Kleinberg, and um, the, the three co-authors were all at Cornell. These two were undergrads at the time, uh, and now Christy's a grad student at Stanford, and G is at MIT. And I'm sure you'll see many more great things from them in the years to come. Um, so I wanted to start this talk by, you know, this is about segregation. So I wanted to show you these two pictures. These are pictures of Chicago and New York. And according to many measures, these are the most segregated cities in the United States. Uh, these pictures are drawn from the 2010 census data. And you'll see in these pictures a bunch of dots of different colors. Uh, we have pink, so, so these like sort of blobs are all um, uh, individual dots, and we have pink dots, we have blue dots, uh, there's green dots like here and at the tip of Manhattan there, and there's orange dots like over there in Chicago. And every dot is a collection of 25 individuals of a single ethnicity centered around where they live. And uh, the... <laughs> It'd be great if this one could be off. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and, and each dot represents people of a different ethnicity. So we have uh, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian. And to give you some orientation, uh, this is Manhattan up here. You can see Central Park is that white rectangle, right? Um, that white rectangle. <laughs> Here we have Chicago. The loop is this sort of like thing in the center of the picture next to the lake, for those of you that know Chicago. So looking at these pictures, can you tell me, can you guess which uh, of these dots are which ethnicity? Which color is which ethnicity? Blue is black. What else? So red is white. Yeah, pink, this pink red color is going to be Caucasian. So th those are the easy ones. Now we also have green and pink. Who knows they're New York? <laughs> uh, pink, pink is, this is pink. This pink is uh, white. So we, we still we have orange and uh, green left. And we have Hispanic and Asian left. Green is Hispanic? Green is, no, green is Asian, actually. So this here is Chinatown in New York, in the south near the financial district. And um, then orange is Hispanic. Uh, so we have here, for example, this is the south side of Chicago, which is how Greg probably knew that was black. And here we have a little pink island. What's that? Yeah, that's Hyde Park. <laughs> so uh, these maps are a lot of fun to play with. They've made them for like uh, pretty much every US city from the 2010 census data, and you can find them on Flickr. Um, but one thing I want to draw, uh, like take away from this slide, is that these cities are indeed segregated. You can see regions of different colors, but they're not like all one color. So they're not segregated on a sort of global scale, on a city scale. They're segregated on a more neighborhood scale. And the sort of message of this talk is going to be, well, I'm going to 
form a very abstract model of segregation in geographical networks. I'm going to study that abstract model, and I'm going to uh, show that in the uh, context of that model, segregation happens on a local scale, not a global scale. And so you'll get neighborhoods that are all one color, but at a city level, the uh, society is actually integrated. So in networks with local neighborhoods, segregation is going to exhi exhibit only local effects. And um, so this work is based on, you know, there's a long line of literature in the sociology world studying segregation. And in prior work, people show that in sort of individual dynamics, due to the discriminatory preferences of individuals, we can get segregation. So, you know, there could be segregation according to many factors, right? You can have segregation according to economic factors. You can have segregation according to, like, uh, accidents of historical location. Uh, and this particular focus, we're going to just uh, model only and focus only on segregation due to discrimination. So this is the idea that, you know, I don't want to be the only female in a computer science department. Um, and so... What was, so the prior work showed that you know, these sort of discriminatory preferences are going to lead to segregation. And in our work, we show that the segregation that results from these discriminatory preferences, we want to sort of characterize the scale of the segregation. And we're going to show that the segregation is local, not global. And one of the sort of main takeaways from the talk is the technique that we use to produce this result. Uh, it gives a lot of intuition about what goes on in practice and how we can uh, sort of modify the dynamics to lead to integration if that's the uh, goal. And so what we're going to show is that large-scale segregation is blocked. The thing that blocks large-scale segregation are small homogenous neighborhoods that form in the initial condition and also form more frequently as the dynamics evolve. And these small homogenous neighborhoods are so frequent and uh, so stable within themselves that they block other uh, waves of immigration from swamping them. Okay, uh, so we're going to see how that works out in the math in a um, few slides. Let me first introduce the model. The model I'm going to use is a model uh, that was introduced by the Nobel Prize winning economist Thomas Schelling in his 1969 paper on segregation and also described in this excellent book, Micromotives and Macro Behavior. Um, and sort of the, the very interesting thing about this book and his work was to show that these local behaviors give rise to global patterns. And so he first introduced this in a model uh, in which you have agents that all live on a ring. Each agent is one of two types, either blue or green, let's say. And these types are exhaustive in the sense that every agent is one of these two types, and they are publicly observable. So I can look at you and tell if you're blue or green. Uh, so every agent lives on a ring, and uh, initially, let's say we flip a coin to decide which agent is which color. So that's the initial condition. And I'm going to define an agent to be happy if they have at least one like-colored neighbor. So this is the intuition that you don't mind living in an integrated neighborhood. Nobody's inherently racist. But you don't want to be a very small minority in your neighborhood. Uh, at every point in time in the dynamics that Schelling studied, he would take two random individuals. If they're both oppositely colored and they're both unhappy in their current location, we'll have them swap locations. So let's think about this for a minute. If they were both unhappy and both oppositely colored, after they swap locations, they necessarily both become happy, right? But they might introduce unhappiness to other agents around them nearby. OK, so th these are the dynamics. I'm going to do this uh, over time. And I want to study what happens as the dynamics converge. You look confused. Yes, I'm going to expand the definition of how sensitive you are to your neighbors, and then you can cause unhappiness. Um, so what I want to study is what the segregation is like as the dynamics converge. And by segregation, I mean the sort of 
run lengths in the final configuration. So here I have a final configuration. I have a run length of size 3, size 4, size 3, and size 2. I'm going to count the uh, average, uh, weighted average of these run lengths in the final configuration, and I want to argue that this is somehow small. Okay, so first, before I state the result formally, I want to introduce to you the parameters of the model. Uh, we're going to have n nodes. There's, nodes are of two types. So this is the size of the society. This is n. This is how many people live in our world. Initial condition, each node is one of each color with probability half. Uh, as I promised, I want to expand the definition of your sensitivity to your neighbors. So I'm going to take the wth power of the ring. Or alternatively, I'm going to, for every node, I'm going to look w nodes to the left counterclockwise, w nodes clockwise. And in that set of 2w plus 1 nodes, that's the set in which I don't want to be a minority. It's an odd number of nodes, so there's always, like, there's never any tie, right? So I'm happy if within that set of 2w plus 1 nodes, I have at least half of my neighbors are of the same type as me. Okay, so, and then every point in time, the dynamics takes two random nodes, and I swap them if they're oppositely colored and both unhappy. And so the parameters that I want to focus on in this talk are the window size w and the society size n. There's two other parameters that I'm fixing through the talk, the fact that everybody is, has half probability of being each color in the initial configuration, and the fact that everybody needs at least half their neighbors to be the same color as them. I'll discuss ways that we could relax these conditions towards the end of the talk. So with this... Uh, set up, what I want to discuss is how big is the segregation in the final configuration? Is it going to be something like, you know, or how, what, what is it as a function of n and w? So the first thing you want to think about when you're thinking about this problem is what sort of final states could I get, right? Does it, does it converge? And if it converges, what sort of sync states might, might arise in the final configuration? So can anybody come up with a Something that's stable, yeah. Yeah. So half half is definitely stable. That would be like an average segregation, an average run length of size n over two, right? And you also said how small we can get is a function of the window size. Does anybody have a precise function for me? as a function of the window size? W. Yeah, so if I, it, it, w plus 1 in fact, but if, if I'm in a run length of size w plus 1, I definitely have w other people that this, are the same color as me, and therefore I'm never going to move. So if I could just have alternating segments of linear and w length, that would also be stable, right? And so from an initial state, I can go to this extreme in which the uh, segregation is something on the scale of the society itself, or I could go to this extreme in which the segregation is something on the scale of a local neighborhood size. And you know, there's many intermediate states that we could get to. And so the question I have is, like, you know, is segregation global? So is it going to be a function of n in this model? Or is it local? Is it going to be some function of w? Yes? Yes, yeah, so in fact, uh, there are other stable configurations in which the minimum run length is not size w plus 1. Um, but those have a very small probability mass, which should be intuitive because you know, when you're flipping coins, you're going to expect to get some long run lengths. right? And then as soon as you have something like that, you can't have something nearby that's small. And you wouldn't expect to convert to always convert. Right, right. Uh, so is segregation global, a uh, function of the size of the society, or is it local, some function of the number of agents, uh, the size of a neighborhood? We're going to see pretty quickly that it's local. That's not hard to show. And then the sort of crux of the argument in our paper, the technical meat of it, comes into answering this question of how large is it as a function of the size of a neighborhood? Is it something like exponential in W, or is it a small like polynomial in W? And uh, in fact, we're going to argue in this talk that it's quadratic in W, and we have a 
new proof that shows it's linear in W, which is sort of the smallest you could hope for given this setup. So let me discuss prior work a little bit. I mentioned that our model is based on a model of shelling. Uh, and in his paper, he, his result was that local dynamics lead to global segregation. And I mean, for a loose notion of global. Um, and he did this using simulations before the age of computers, I guess. He had 70 nodes. And he just simulated it by hand with a window size w equals 4. And he observed that in the final configuration, the average segregation uh, was something like 12. Okay, so 12 is much less than 35, which is one extreme we saw, and it's much more than 4, which is the other extreme. So, you know, what, what is it more like? Is it more like 12? Is it, is it more like 35? Is it more like 4? Um, and basically, his paper was just introducing the model and, and observing this effect. Um, so after that, yeah? So we want to keep the number of agents constant. You could also think about people moving in and out uh, from a sort of exogenous source of agents. But uh, we, we want to keep a sort of closed society. So if you're unhappy, you have to find somebody to uh, change houses with or sell your house and rebuy it on the market and buy another one on the market. Um, so people have spent many, a lot of effort trying to come up with some formal analysis of this model. And it's kind of difficult because what we have here is a Markov chain which has some sync states. And so that's not very well behaved. There's no well-defined stationary distribution. And so how are we going to analyze this? One way that we can analyze this is using the notion of stochastic stability, which has been developed in uh, sort of the economics literature. Uh, so Peyton Young did this in 2001. And what he looked at was a sort of, so what is stochastic stability? It's this idea that I can take a dynamic and perturb it a bit, and then study these perturbed dynamics, and then try to send the perturbations to zero. So what do I do? I take every point in time two random nodes. I have them swap with some probability epsilon, even if they're both unhappy, or one of them is unhappy. And if they are both, sorry, even if they're both happy, or only one of them is unhappy. And if they're both unhappy, I definitely have them switch. Okay, so I'm just adding noise to these dynamics. And then I can look at the stationary distribution, and this is going to be some function of this noise parameter, epsilon. And then I can take the limit as I send this noise to zero and ask what is the uh, distribution look like when the limit goes to zero. It's going to you know, point me towards one of these sync states. And in his analysis, it shows that the sync state of half the world is one color and half the other color is the uh, unique outcome. So complete global segregation is inevitable if we do these sort of perturbed dynamics. And I think one sort of contribution of our work is showing that this kind of perturbed dynamic, which obviously is mathematically not completely rigorous because we can't interchange this limit with this analysis, right? So when we do the exact analysis, we get something that's very, a very different conclusion. We get sort of the opposite conclusion, uh, which is that these local dynamics induce a small degree of local segregation that's independent of the size of the society. This appeared in Stock 2012. Uh, and the theorem, the you know, sort of precise form of the theorem is that the segregation is something quadratic in W. OK, so I guess one, so as I said, one contribution I feel is showing that this is a stark difference from the young predictions. Uh, let me just say a few words about that. The prediction of the stochastic stability analysis is uh, you know, doing this sort of stationary distribution. So you should ask about the mixing time of the Markov chain. And that was actually exponential. So one sort of like maybe resolution of this tension here is that in the medium term dynamics, the uh, segregation observed even in the stochastic stability model is more like what we're looking at here. I don't know. That, that would be an interesting thing to do. I haven't tried that analysis. Um, another thing that you can look at this and ask yourself is, 
you know, I'm trying to study some sort of model of rational agents, uh, but how much do we believe in these dynamics that we are introducing? Like, maybe agents actually do make some small mistakes when they're trying to optimize. And if they are making small mistakes, maybe we believe more the young model than the exact analysis. Uh, and so there's some tension there. Um, so in that re regard, you can look at this as sort of a, a mathematical result. But also, the techniques that we're using to prove this result, I think, are very uh, indicative of what's going on and why the young model is actually giving a very different prediction from our model. Uh, so the technique that we use is this notion of a firewall, this sort of, as I said, these like very stable, small, homogeneous neighborhoods. So we all observed in the last few slides that if we have W plus one consecutive individuals that are all the same color, this set, this neighborhood is going to be fixed throughout the entire process. Once we see one of these, nobody in that is ever going to move away, right? But if we have this stochastic stability thing, these things are going to break down. And I believe that that's sort of problematic, that that's giving rise to the uh, prediction of the Young model. OK, so what we want to do is, in order to prove our results, is to look for these firewalls. And you know, firewalls are stable with respect to the dynamics. So once we find firewalls, it's sort of it's a blocking structure that bounds the growth of of segregation. It bounds the like uh, waves of immigration in the model. And I also, you know, this is a technique that we use in this paper, but I think it's pretty general in the sense that when you're trying, I do a lot of work studying these kinds of dynamic models on networks, and you can often get a lot of intuition by finding blocking structures and then arguing something about the existence of blocking structures in your dynamics. Um, so, the proof, I'm going to show you first that the process indeed reaches a stable configuration uh, with high probability. So uh, then I want to argue that the average segregation is independent of the ring size, so that this is not a function of n, it's some function of w. These two steps are quite easy and uh, follow almost directly from this intuition behind a firewall. Um, and then we want to argue that the average segregation is, in fact, modest. And in order to do that, we're going to need to argue something about the formation of firewalls as the dynamics evolve. So let's start with convergence. The convergence proof is based on counting the number of individuals that belong to firewalls, basically. So what we can do is we can come up with some sort of potential function like argument and say that the number of individuals that belong to firewalls only grows over time, and then, then we must converge at some point. Uh, the reason this is with high probability is that I'm conditioning on the fact that a firewall appears in the initial configuration. right? And that's going to happen with probability, well, I need to flip a coin and get w heads in a row. So that happens with something like exponentially small in w. Okay, So, so uh, with probability 1 minus something exponentially small in w, I'm in a state where I have a firewall in the initial configuration, and then these things can only grow over time. Uh, so I'm going to skip the uh, proof of that. Uh, but I think you could all sort of use, do it as a homework problem and see how, how that would work out. So the next thing to argue is that the average segregation is in fact independent of the ring size. And this is also pretty easy from this concept of a firewall. So I want everybody to verify that you understand how to use notions of firewalls to bound the run length, because I'm going to use this argument again. Okay? So what do I do? I want to look at what's the size of the run length that this random site appears in at the end of the day, after the dynamics have converged. And so let's condition on this site appearing in a green run. So it's, it's in some long green neighborhood. How long could that green neighborhood be? Well. Let's look to the left until we see the first blue firewall in the initial configuration. And let's look to the right until we see the first blue firewall in the initial configuration. Now, since these blue firewalls appeared in the initial configuration, and they're fixed with respect to the dynamics, we know that the green run length that this guy lives in at the end of the day can't be longer than the distance between these two blue firewalls. 
So how far should I look to find a blue firewall? Well, let's chunk the ring into segments of size w, and let's uh, define a random variable, which is one if this chunk of size w is all blue. That event happens with probability 2 to the minus w. And so I should look uh, something like 2 to the w chunks to the left until I find a blue firewall. right? and 2 to the w chunks to the right until I find a blue firewall. So therefore, the length of the green firewall containing this site is going to be an expectation, something like w times 2 to the w. And that was conditioning on it being in a green uh, run length at the end of the day, but we have a symmetric argument for it being in a blue run length at the end of the day. So this shows that the uh, average run length is going to be independent of the size of the society n. Is this argument clear? Yeah? Sorry, what do we mean exactly by average segregation or average segregation? Yeah, I'm counting the weighted average. So I, I'm looking, or I mean, alternatively, you can just say for an arbitrary site, what's the expected size of the thing it lives in? Or you can average over everything the size of it times the probability of it occurring. Um, they're equivalent. Okay, so this shows that we get segregation that's not on a societal scale, but on a neighborhood scale. And the sort of, and all of that happened without any arguments about their dynamics, other than the fact that these firewalls are stable with respect to the dynamics. So the sort of meat of our argument is in showing that the average segregation is modest. And in order to do that, I want to sh argue about the fact that uh, these firewalls become more frequent as the dynamics evolve. Okay, and again, this is like all the intuition is, is in this statement. Uh, so if you want to think about a new process, people always ask me lots of questions about vary this parameter, vary that parameter. What you should think about is how would that affect the emergence of firewalls in, in the course of the dynamics. So let's uh, spend a little bit of time arguing that these firewalls emerge frequently as the dynamics evolve. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to define something, a structure that I call a firewall incubator. Okay, this is going to be some consecutive uh, sequence of nodes that are rich in one type. Uh, like a blue firewall is going to be a sequence of nodes that's rich in blue types in the initial configuration. And green is going to be a sequence of nodes that's rich in green types in the initial configuration. And I'll, I'll describe what I mean mathematically by rich. Um, but what I want from this sort of structure is I want it to be frequent at the initialization. And I want each of them to be likely to become firewalls. So uh, first, I will prove by picture what's going on in these dynamics. And I really like this paper because it's one of those rare instances where you can just prove everything by picture and, it's, and it just works beautifully, exactly like it should. So the picture is going to make use of this notion of bias, okay? So I'm going to assign to every color in my ring a sign plus one or minus one. And so all the green guys get a minus one, all the blue guys get a plus one. And now I want to define the bias of a site to be the sum of the signs of the uh, sites in its neighborhood. So this guy, the bias is, well, if W was two, we have these five nodes are in this neighborhood. We have four plus ones and one minus one, so the bias is plus three. And so what does a bias mean? What's a positive bias? Yeah, it's a neighborhood where a blue guy is happy. It's a site where a blue guy would be happy living there. And a negative bias is a site where a green guy would be happy living there. OK, so this is what the bias looks like at the beginning of the day. Um, here I've, sw I've swapped uh, green for red. So all you colorblind people can uh, at least understand one of the two pictures. Um, OK, so on the top, on the bottom here, I just have the like, alignment of types in the ring in the initial configuration. And the top, what I'm plotting is the biases of the sites. So the dotted line, so there's a blue line, then a dotted line, then a red line. The dotted line is a bias of zero. No site has bias of zero, but okay, that's, the, that's zero. A blue is a square root w plus square root w. 
And red, the red line on the bottom, is a minus square root w. So it's one standard div from the expectation. Right? And uh, this you know, zigzaggy line is the bias of every site that it's positioned above. So I'm going to define a firewall incubator to be some site that is, or some sequence of sites that is sufficiently biased for sufficiently long. So one of these mountains or valleys in this picture. So let's pick one with our eyes and track what happens to it as we run this simulation. Uh, you can pick some, some mountain. I don't know, here's some blue guys, for example, that are pretty biased for pretty long. So just track one of them with your eyes. And what we see is that as time evolves, these mountains get higher and the valleys get deeper until we eventually converge to a very extreme landscape like this. Okay. So the crux of the argument is to show that these tall mountains are likely to become firewalls at the end of the day. Uh, in order to do that, I should define these firewalls a little bit more precisely, these firewall incubators. So remember that I have a, a sign associated with each site in the ring, which is a function of the color of individual that's at that site at that moment in time. And the bias of a site at a particular time is the sum of the signs of the sites in its neighborhood. And now I'm going to, yeah? So that's. Uh, so in reality, those are continuous. Oh, oh, the window fits inside the space, so it doesn't the bias doesn't increase any so the longer the maximum value is w. Yeah. 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 Uh, so a firewall incubator is going to be a sequence of three bias blocks. We have defenders surrounding an internal thing. I, I mean, all this terminology is supposed to be like you know. Mnemonic. So what, what we're thinking of as going on here is that these defenders are defending these internal sites from being infiltrated from the outside and, and these internal sites are going to turn into firewalls. So that's what we're hoping. So we have these defenders. Uh, each of them has size W plus 1. They surround an internal guy. And what I want to guarantee is that the bias of this entire uh, sequence of three blocks, which is what I call the firewall incubator, is high for sufficiently long. So the bias of every site in this incubator I require to be at least root w. And uh, the minimum bias is in this like, block is going to be at the endpoints. Um, for now, you know, what I want to show is that this, so this is some mountain in my initial configuration. I want to show that this mountain becomes a firewall. And so in order to do that, I'm going to look at the attackers that are surrounding this, this block. And I want to analyze the battleground that's, you know, this battle that's going on between the attacker and the defender. So, you know, what is an attacker? I don't have any conditions on the biases of these attackers other than those that are implied by the conditions on the biases inside the firewall incubator itself. And uh, these attackers are pot potentially pretty biased towards green individuals, and therefore they're dragging down the bias of the firewall incubator. And as the dynamics evolve, it could be that the blue guys inside these attackers are unhappy and they're swapping out, which is even more eroding these mountains. And so what I want to show is that, you know, the erosion, that the mountain becomes a firewall before it gets eroded by the attackers. Um, so this is the definition of a firewall incubator. Pictorially, this is what I mean. If you, if you prefer the pictures, right? Here I have the attackers, the defenders, and the internal block, and the bias should be sufficiently high for sufficiently long. OK, so there's two things I want to do with this structure. First, I should argue to you that this structure happens a lot in the initial configuration. And then I should argue that this structure is going to give birth to firewalls pretty frequently. And that would therefore imply that I get a firewalls with a lot more higher frequency as the dynamics evolve than I did in the initial configuration. OK, great. So both of these proofs are going to rely on a very beautiful theorem. And 
Uh, I want It's a well-known theorem. I want to prove it to you. If you don't care about anything about segregation or anything I've said so far, you can start paying attention now. This is a completely self-contained little cute fact that you can like, you know, use to impress your friends at parties and stuff. So you have some uh, box. You, you have some election. You have a bunch of people voted in this election. And they all cast their ballots into some box. And now you want to count the ballots in the box. And you're just going to pull the ballots out one by one in a random order. And you're going to keep a tally of which candidate is winning the election. And what I want to ask is, what's the probability that the guy that won the election at the end of the day was always ahead at every step when you were doing the counting? This is called the ballot theorem. In a sort of more mathematical language, the uh, question is, we have this random walk with a fixed number of up and down steps. And uh, we want to ask, what's the probability that this walk never hits the x-axis? Is it clear that these are the same question? OK, so I, this proof is just so cute and beautiful. Uh, the, so let's do it. I can do it in one slide. I have p up steps and q down steps. The walk starts at 0, 0. It ends at a, b. OK, so uh, I want to ask, what's the probability it never hits the x-axis? That's going to be 1 minus the probability it does hit the x-axis. Just simple rule of complementarity. Uh, OK, so let's think about what, you know, in what ways could it hit the x-axis? Well, it could have its first step go up and then come back and hit the x-axis before it ends high. Or it could have the first step go down, and then it'll definitely hit the x-axis, because we know it ends above the x-axis. So it, we, we can break this probability of hit event into two disjoint events. These are disjoint because the first step is either up or down, uh, with, and make it 1 minus the probability it hits going up, plus uh, the probability it hits and it's going down. Now. The key, the, very, the you know, beautiful moment of the proof is now. What we do is we look at what we call the reflection principle, which is that I can create a bijection between walks that start up and walks that start down. And how do I do that? I imagine that this x-axis is a lake, and I look at the reflection of the mountain in the lake up until the point when it first crosses the x-axis. So through this trick, I have a mapping between walks that start up and hit the x-axis, and walks that start down, down and hit the x-axis. It should be clear that this is a bijection, correct? And so now all I need to do is look at the probability that I hit the x-axis and I start down, which is simply the probability I start down, because every walk that starts down has to hit the x-axis. And so we can write this in terms of the parameters of the problem. Uh, you know, Since I'm pulling ballots out randomly, it's just the probability that the first ballot was for the losing candidate. And so I get uh, a probability of q over p plus q that I hit the that I start my walk down, and in terms of the primitives of the problem, that's a probability of b over a. Okay, so this is the ballot theorem. I think it's a very nice theorem, and it's very useful for us because it allows us to prove, for example, that firewalls are frequent in the initial configuration, which, by the way, shouldn't be much of a surprise, because all I'm asking is that I'm like one standard d away from my expectation for sufficiently long. right? So uh, I'm not going to prove this for you, but the, using the ballot theorem, you can show that we're going to get firewalls frequent in the initial configuration. Uh, and we can also use the ballot theorem to argue that firewall uh, incubators are likely to become firewalls. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Yeah? I was just wondering, do we need n to be kind of big? Uh, there are constants, you know, hiding in places. Uh, yeah, we actually do need something like that, which is a little, we kind of try to sweep it under a rug, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Yes, I'm going to need, I need the exponential in W in a later step, which you haven't seen yet. <laughs> um, so far, I'm, yeah, so far everything's kosher, even with that caveat. Uh, so 
In order to argue that these firewall incubators become firewalls, what I need to do is look at you know, the, the dynamics, who's swapping where, and it's gonna be a bad swap for me if a blue guy moves out of an attacker because that's eroding my mountain. And it's a good swap for me if a green guy moves out of my defender, that's building up my mountain. And so I also know that there's uh, many more bad swaps than good swaps. So what I want to argue is that the good swaps, not too many bad swaps occur early in the process. And in order to do that, I first I'm going to argue that let's assume that these swaps occur in a random order. And if those swaps occur in a random order, then I can use the ballot theorem again to show that I get a firewall with probability order one over W. Okay, that in this battleground here that's going on between these two guys, all of these good swaps happen before too many bad swaps happen. Okay, now there's two issues with these two ideas here. First is that this one over W is a little bit smaller than we'd like it to be. Um, and in order, we'd like it to be something constant, and you'll see why a constant here would imply that my average run length in the final configuration is like order W. And I, the reason I'm proving to you order W squared right now is precisely because I have a one over W here. We're able to fix that by coming up with a more sophisticated definition of a firewall incubator. The other issue here is this swaps occur in a random order. So I'd like to assume that swaps occur in a uniformly random order in order to apply this ballot theorem, but that's not true. Why is that not true? Well, remember at every point in time, I'm taking two nodes uniformly at random from my ring and I'm swapping them if they're both oppositely colored and unhappy. Well, that means that if I have many more unhappy blue individuals than unhappy green individuals, the green guys are much more likely to swap. And this is problematic for me because my ballot theorem is drawing ballots uniformly at random from my box. So if the number of unhappy individuals of each type is equal, then I can claim that the swaps are a random order. And so what I want to do is argue that they are approximately equal for long enough for these firewalls to form before we sort of tip into having a majority of one type being unhappy. This is a statement, in order to prove a statement like this, we use this sort of heavy hammer called Wormwald's technique. Um, and this technique allows you to approximate a, a discrete time stochastic process by a differential equation. So you can write down a differential equation, you basically take the continuous limit and you can prove that this is a good approximation so long as the differential equation satisfies some sort of Lipschitz-like conditions, this is a good approximation for uh, you know, the beginning of the process for, for some period of time. And so in order to show that, you know, in order to apply this, we take the following steps. We want to prove that the transcripts, that these sort of swap orders are close to random, okay? And in order to do that, I, want to show that the number of unhappy individuals of each type is close in number. So it might not be exactly, that might not be an equality there, right? So at each time, if there are more unhappy types of one color than another color, I'm going to censor swaps. I'm going to take K people of the majority type. I'm going to censor them. And I'm going to say any swap that involved those guys is a censored swap. And then I'm going to condition on there being no censored swaps. And if these two things are close, then the probability of choosing a censored swap is small. So I'm not losing much by conditioning on this event. This is a large probability event. Uh, so it's a rare event. And so how am I going to show that those things are close? Um, in order to do that, I want to use this Wormald technique. So remember what Wormald said. It says that the, this process is well approximated by some differential equation. And if I can write down the differential equation, I, can, I need to check some conditions of it, and I can prove that it approximates my discrete time process for long enough. So how am I going to write down this differential equation? 
I need to come up with some variables that characterize my process and, and talk about how they change over time. Like, what's this variable today look like as a function of the state yesterday? So the sort of natural variable that you'd like to use, because what we care about is, remember, is the difference between the number of unhappy individuals of each type. So what you'd like to do is introduce the state variable delta that uh, counts the difference between, say, the number of unhappy green individuals and unhappy blue individuals. OK, well, that's great, because initially, this variable is small, right? And there's, in the initial configuration, I'm just flipping coins. There's no bias towards any color. So I expect the number of unhappies of each type to be approximately equal. And um, it also has a small change when it's close to 0. Because by one swap, I can't change this number very much. But the problem with trying to write down this exact differential equation is that this is a function of many unmodeled state variables. It's actually this, this delta, the way it changes today based on yesterday, is a function not just of what it, this delta was yesterday, but the exact pattern of the ring yesterday. And so we need to be a little bit more careful. In order to come up with a more correct uh, differential approximation, we have to actually um, model what the ring looked like yesterday. So we're going to introduce these variables sigma, which are counting what the ring looked like yesterday. Sigma is some string of red and blue. Okay, and what I want to count is for, uh, so there's one state variable sigma for any potential string of red and blue. And what I'm gonna count is the number of times I see that string as I move clockwise around my ring. So for example, sigma equals green, it's going to count the number of green individuals in the ring. Sigma equals like w plus 1 greens is going to count the number of green firewalls in the ring. Um, so you know, I have this state variable in my differential equation, and then I can use these the state variables to express what they look like today as a function of what they looked like yesterday. And I can also use them to uh, count the number of unhappy individuals of each color. And this is a totally messy, ugly differential equation, right? I wouldn't want to write this down. Uh, but the nice thing about this is that I don't actually need to solve this differential equation to make the argument I need about the number of unhappy colors of each type being equal. Why is that? Because my initial state is preserved under this operation of swapping green and blue. Right? And the dynamics themselves are uh, symmetric with, with respect to green and blue. There's no way in which I inherently in the dynamics favor one color over the other color. And therefore, the solution to this differential equation always satisfies this condition that uh, it's preserved under the operation of swapping green and blue. Um, so furthermore, in the differential equation, the number of unhappy green equals the number of unhappy blue. And so when I use it to approximate my discrete time process, I know that the number of unhappy green is approximately equal to the number of unhappy blue. Now there's another issue here that is a bit technical, but also we struggled with for a very long time, which is that Wormald's conditions, when I want to say that this differential equation approximates my discrete time process, he has all sorts of conditions that the differential equation must satisfy in order for this to hold. So we need to argue things about like that it's kind of smooth in some sense of smooth. And furthermore, we had to argue something about dependency chains of these, uh, of these state variables. And our uh, differential equation here has infinitely long dependency chains. And um, so we had to introduce a lot of sort of techniques to deal with these, this highly complex differential equation. So I'll refer you to the paper for that if you're interested. It's sort of more technical than I'd like to get into in this talk. But using his technique, we can argue that the number of unhappy nodes of each type is approximately equal. And therefore, we can apply the ballot theorem to argue that the swaps in our battleground in the firewall incubator uh, happens in a good way, such that we turn into a firewall before the mountain is eroded. And that's going to prove this second statement here, that firewall incubators are likely to come, become firewalls with some probability like 1 over w in the current analysis. Uh, 
so again, we can now plug this back into the argument we had at the beginning to show that it was independent of n and argue that the sort of the expected run length of some arbitrary site in the final configuration is not independent of n, but it's in fact at most quadratic in W. And again, we can get this down to linear. Okay, so that proves everything I promised to you, but what I, I like about this paper is that it gives us intuitions about changes in the model, about perturbations in the model, in addition to proving this statement about the model itself. So sort of one very natural perturbation that you might want to make in the model is to change this tolerance parameter, right? I said that everybody's happy if at least half their neighborhood has the same color that they do. So what happens if I make people more tolerant? which would mean decreasing tau. So now everybody is happy if at least, say, a third of the people are the same type as they are. So it's actually really interesting, but I, it will make sense when I explain it to you, that as you decrease tau very little, you actually increase segregation. So everybody, and you know, when I had people will say, insisting on being a majority in their neighborhood, I got a pretty integrated society. When I say, okay, you know, I'm happy if I'm just not too small a minority, something like 50% minus, 50 minus epsilon, then all of a sudden I get exponential size segregation. Um, and why does that happen? Well, what's happening is that in the initial configuration, in the 50% case, almost everybody's unhappy, right? So everybody's actively working to improve their situation. They're, they're like swapping out when they can to make themselves live in places they like. But when I take 50% minus epsilon, in the initial configuration, almost everybody's happy. So they're complacent. They're just sort of sitting around doing nothing. And you get these, the people that are unhappy are the ones that are living on the edge of these monochromatic neighborhoods. And so those people are swapping out while the sort of integrated neighborhoods are just sitting there doing nothing. And so these initial firewalls are creating waves of immigration that swap the integrated neighborhoods and just swallow them up and make them, make them homogenous. Okay, and um, so that's, ex that's sort of the exact intuition of how we're getting in intense segregation when we drop the tolerance parameter. Basically, you know, these firewalls are failing to form as the dynamics evolve because nobody's moving around in the, bi in the somewhat biased regions. And so we can make this precise. Uh, the, there is a paper on archive that's doing this um, for any potential tau, any tolerance parameter. They show that for a constant tolerance, we get, I mean, for a small enough tolerance, we get constant size neighborhoods. Of course, that's kind of intuitive if you have if you don't care at all about the composition of your neighborhood, you never move, and so we get integration from the beginning. Uh, for some tolerance parameter, somewhere between a third and a half, we're going to get exponential size segregation, exponential in W. And for the tolerance equal to 0.5, this is the case that is studied in our paper, we get something that's linear in W. Uh, and for I'm not completely sure I believe this result, but they claim that for segregation, uh, for tolerance greater than 0.5, you get complete segregation. And then there's also issues of how you even define the movement dynamics for tolerance greater than 0.5, because I might not be happy in the neighborhood I'm swapping into, even if you're unhappy there. Uh, so this is, this is one sort of perturbation you can take in the model. And future work, we're interested in varying uh, other parameters. So we can look at different fractions of types. Uh, we just had half green, half blue, and many sort of settings in which you might want to study segregation, there's a definite minority type. So what happens if we have different fractions of types? Uh, I believe that if we have the tolerance parameters also be uh, different but across the types, such that everybody wants to live in a neighborhood whose composition is, reflects that of the entire society. Okay, so you think about this tau thing as being multiplicative of the fractions that exist in the society, then uh, we'll get similar results to what, what we have here. Um, we can also look at more than two types. That, that introduces a lot of issues about how to model more than two types. Or what I'm most interested in is looking at other graph models. I'd like to understand 
you know, this degree of segregation as a function of the graph structure, some sort of maybe expansiveness of the graph or something like this. Uh, as a first step in that direction, I tried looking at grid networks. So this is a simulation that was done in a grid. Uh, we have here, we're, we're making it a torus to remove boundary conditions, of course. And um, everybody, we have tau equal 0.5 and we're doing this swap dynamic. And what you see is that as the dynamics settle down, you get something that doesn't look like complete segregation again. It's sort of, I would argue that this picture is in some sense similar to the dynamic we studied on a ring. And I think I know what's going on, which is that if you squint a little bit, what you see in this picture is not like completely random, but what you see sort of like spheres of one color that's connected by thin tendrils. That's what I want you to think of when you see this picture. A bunch of, a bunch of uh, you know, round circular neighborhoods that are connected to each other by thin tendrils. And so what I think is going on is these, we, we get these sort of firewall-like things, which are spheres that are growing. And when these spheres butt up against each other, they stop. And we're, again, in a similar intuition, we're getting, in the initial configuration, we have some spheres, and we have a lot of areas that are going to create spheres as the dynamics evolve. Um, so I think I'll stop there and take questions. Yes. Um, w can grow very slowly with n, but we the wormwall technique is what's killing us here. So somewhere in there, we need n to be more than like exponential or doubly exponential even in W. <laughs> so. My question was about the, the symmetry argument we're making in the differential equation. So is the statement you're saying is that so in a as if when n is large, these fractions for any pattern sigma are approximately the same if I swap green blue. So f sigma is roughly the same as f sigma prime. In the initial configuration, the initial this, configuration yes. In that part. And then, so when you, in the differential equation, you, you kind of eliminate this difference in the fractions. And, yes. And then that property is preserved. Yes, exactly. And I guess because you have these fractions you know, in windows of size, order W or something like that, is why you kind of need N exponential W. Yep. <laughs> so what's the most dynamic to, to use the We again do the swap thing. Everybody, so if I wanted to generalize our model to an arbitrary graph, I would say let's take the W with power of the graph and look at all of my neighbors in that. In the, you know what the power of a graph is? Okay, so I, I look at everybody that's you know within W hops of me, and um, so here I'm doing exactly that. I'm I'm taking the Wth power of this grid, and I'm asking to be not a minority in that Wth power. So you know the circles have like some guys on the fringe that are not happy because like a quarter of their neighborhood is in the circle, but then three quarters of their neighborhood is not in the circle. Um, and so, yeah. No, it's, this is not the converged point, and uh, we haven't tried to prove that either, but um, there are definitely sync states, so like half, half again is going to be a sync state. Yeah, there could be, yeah. Yeah? Uh, I'm just curious about other possible dynamics. Like, so people in evolutionary dynamics have different methods for how to change. But maybe your techniques would apply to those very easily? Yeah, so, um, you know, what you need is these structures, these firewalls, not to be broken very easily. Uh, another dynamic, and, and also for them to evolve from the firewall incubator. So another dynamic that the shelling uh, strands of literature look at is 
an empty space type dynamic. So you can think about on the ring, if you're unhappy, you can pick a random location and insert yourself. So you pick a, a node and a, and a sort of like, let's insert somebody in the ring, right? And then not an existing site. But, so we, we initially were going to study that dynamic and it proved mathematically frustrating without seeming to give different stories. So we switched to this, which is actually what Young is anyway analyzing as well. But uh, you know, when I think about these different dynamics, I always ask myself, how would that affect these firewalls? Are they still going to be stable with respect to these dynamics? And certainly, if you're inserting yourself, you're not going to insert yourself into the middle of a firewall of the other color. So that's why my intuition is that with that kind of dynamic, it's going to work. And more generally, if you're looking at these evolutionary game theory type statements, what you want to look at is, can I come up with some kind of local stable thing? 